Come on. Welcome to Money Savage, a Savage Approach to Personal Finance. This is George Grumbacher, and the time is right. And welcome to our monthly book club, and welcome to our author, Emily Balchettis. Emily, are you ready to do this? Oh, absolutely. Excellent. Let, let's do this. Emily is a PhD. She is an associate professor of psychology at NYU, and she is the author of Clearer, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World. Emily, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and what motivated you to write the book. Sure. Yeah, I was really excited to write this book uh, at a point in my life where I had some time off. Um, it was, you know, sort of, you know, the, the end of my first third of my career, and I wanted to try something new to sort of stitch together all the research that my team and I have been doing over the last 15 years. And, it, and so I set out to write this book and it was a disaster. So <laughs> the first, I thought it would take a year all in. It took a year to get the proposal done and I was ready to throw in the towel, but you know, the tides turned and the project took off. Um, and it's been, it's been really amazing. So, so the book is about strategies based on our scientific evidence to help us improve the likelihood that we're going to meet our goals. So we tackle all kinds of goals related to personal well-being, financial well-being, satisfaction with with mental and physical health. Uh, and at the root of it, you know, we're taking what are the common problems that people face when they're setting motive, setting goals, maintaining their motivation, and then, you know, trying to hold themselves accountable or maybe change course if that's necessary. And these problems are common, regardless of the kind of goal that we have, the root of it, the psychology of it is, is pretty common. And so that's what we're trying to unpack in this book is what are these common obstacles and are there some strategies that, that maybe we don't know to implement, maybe we haven't talked about it, maybe not, we're not realizing that we're doing it and it might work or it might not work. Uh, and then, you know, breaking that down. So that's really the inspiration is to, to translate this, you know, 15 years of science into something that's tangible and concrete that people can apply to whatever they pose as a challenge for themselves. Piece of cake. Let's take 15 years and cram it into uh, one book. Right. That might have been my problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, so when, when people pick it up, what are you hoping that 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 that, that the reader gets out of it? Well, four strategies. That's what I'm hoping they take away. Our four strategies that are based off of our eyes. Now, now why our eyes? You know, why am I talking about like vision as a as a common denominator for for thinking about new approaches to satisfying uh, or you know, satisfying our life goals? Well, I think, you know, it's really amazing what our eyes can do. And we sort of take it for granted. Right. Like when we touch stuff, we know that like, oh, I'm not really sure what that is. Is that is that silk or is it polyester? Or when we're tasting something, we might recognize that we're not really sure what that flavor profile is. We're talking to people and we we know that we've misheard them, but we never get that kind of correction with our eyes. Hmm. Right. We look at the world. We think that what we see is what's really out there. You know, I'm having a lovely conversation with you and I can see you over Skype, but like you're not going to turn into my mother, right? I'm not going to be looking at you. And then all of a sudden what I thought I was looking at isn't true. Yeah. But yes, you'll never turn into my mother. And I'm grateful <laughs> for that for many reasons. But actually there's a lot of things that we look at at the world around us that, that we think we're seeing the right way, but we aren't. And that is actually powerful. That is really the key um, to, to, to giving us a new way of looking at the world, which can open up all kinds of possibilities for helping us make better progress. Nice. That's, that's fascinating. I, I, uh, what, 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 what jumped into my mind was watching Hell's Kitchen years ago, and Chef Ramsay would, would blindfold people and put like turkey in their mouth, and they would say that it was the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I don't know if that's kind of accurate or not, but oh, it's totally accurate. And there's actually been studies done when you do the same kind of thing to people and they're tasting wine. You don't let them see the wine that they're drinking, and and a large proportion of people will confuse red and white wine when they can't see what it is that they're tasting. And I mean, I think both of these are great examples of how powerful sight is. Yeah. And yet we don't realize it when we're trying to think of like, what's another way that I can motivate myself? Like the most common strategies that people use are to, you know, engage in positive self-talk. Like you got this, you can do this. Positive affirmations, super mm -hmm. common. Or asking people for help. 
And usually what those people say is, oh, you're not trying hard enough. I don't know, maybe you don't really want it. These things are not true. Right? That is not the reason that we are struggling to meet our goals. Um, it's not that we're not trying hard enough. It's not that we're not setting those goals. And, and the reason why self-affirmations aren't going to push us over the finish line for every goal that we have is because it's really hard. It's hard to continue to engage in that positive self-talk when we're seeing real obstacles. So that's why I'm suggesting let's try tactics that maybe we've never even thought of using before. Let's use our eyes. Let's literally try to see our opportunities, see our surroundings in a different way, and maybe we'll make better progress. Let me give you a concrete example, if yeah, you don't mind. Please. This work, this work started, or this interest of mine started when I was trying to figure out how can we help people to exercise better? It's, it's, it's the number one New Year's resolution every single year because people are continuing to struggle with staying in shape. Of course, eating is, is really important, and so too is exercising. And you know, increasing our step count, going out more often and engaging in more intense exercise is really what needs to happen and couple that with, with better eating, with healthier eating. So we were trying to figure out, my first step was like, well, let's, I'll ask, I'll ask world renowned Olympic athletes, like, what do you do when you're trying to up your game? What strategies are you using? Let's just start at the top and see if we can get some insights from them. And I said, when you're running, what do you do to try to run faster? What are you looking at? And now my intuition was like, they're tracking the competition, right? When they're performing at that level, you know, it's they're they've already you know, the personal record, personal best. Yes, I'm sure that that matters, but it's really about nudging, you know, beating out the person who is right on their heels. So they're going to be really attentive to what is around them. And I was totally wrong. That's not what they do. Nope. They no, I, I mean, that's sort of the hallmark of my career is I go in with an insight. I think I've got it right. I test it and, and I'm not and I'm wrong. Um, but the data can, can prove what is right. And that's what I rely on. So so these interviews told me that they're actually really narrowly focused. It's, you know, almost as if they have blinders on. They're not paying attention to where the competition is. They are just focused on their goal. And in, and in this case, it's literally the finish line. Right. When they're when they're running a 400 meter race or, you know, a hundred meter dash or something like that. They are just focused on where they want to be. And I thought, okay, well, if that's, you know, if my intuition was wrong as a non Olympian and hardly a runner, <laughs> you know, maybe other people's intuition is intuitions are wrong also about what they should do. And maybe we can teach them to use a strategy that the Olympians use. And so I did, we we've conducted, you know, many studies on thousands of people and we taught them to use this narrowed focus of attention. When you're going out for a walk, you're trying to run, you're trying to run a little bit faster, choose a mark, you know, find a building that's got an interesting mural on it that you can see up ahead, or choose a stop sign that's just two blocks away and keep your eyes focused on it. When you need an extra little boost, you feel like bailing now, find a goal and keep your eyes focused on it. And what we found was that when we trained people to do that and compared it to how they look naturally around the world, which is with a more wide sort of frame of reference, we found that people increased their rate of speed by 23%, and they said it hurt 17% less. Hmm. So the distance was the same. We held that constant. This was a tightly controlled experiment. So we know that the distance they're actually moving is exactly the same, but they see that they see the finish line is closer. It produces a visual illusion, this narrowed focus of attention, and that is what is responsible for helping them to move faster and to say it hurt less. And at the end of the day, I'm a behavioral scientist and a psychologist. So when you're looking at, well, well, what happens then? If they've had this experience, that's better than they thought it would be. They performed better and it didn't hurt as much. Maybe there's long-term consequences, and there are. People who use that narrowed focus of attention, they go out for walks more often when we follow their, their activity on um, fitness, fitness tracker apps. They go out for walks more often. They take more steps within the same time period. Um, and they've increased the intensity of, of their exercise because at the end of the day, what they thought was going to be a challenge ends up not being as hard as they thought. They sort of tricked themselves into seeing the world as an easier place to navigate. And that inspires, um, better performance and then continued motivation, continued engagement with this task. So when I'm saying like, let's try looking at the world differently. This is one example, like try narrowing our focus of attention. Imagine there's a spotlight just, you know, shining on, on one goal that you have ahead of you. And when you hit that mark, try resetting a goal and focusing again. Fascinating. And that certainly does make sense. 
so is it possible to 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 apply this to long term goal setting? Absolutely. So in the context of exercise, I think this works really well when we need that extra boost. You know, if we're trying to run 26 26 miles, let's say we're trying to run a marathon, that would be pretty exhausting to set every two blocks to set yourself a new goal. Although some of the, you know, the the best female runners Um, the best runners in the world, some of which who happen to be female and talk about what they do, they actually do set these micro goals for themselves for the entirety of the race. Mm -hmm. Um, But it could be tiring for the rest of us to continue to use that strategy. And so probably, you know, staying a bit more open at the beginning, but then when we're feeling tired and we need an extra uh, boost, stay focused, narrow the focus of attention. But this does apply for for other types of goals that aren't related to physical fitness, but maybe financial fitness or financial health. And those are long-term goals, right? Yeah, so definitely there are strategies that are really effective for long-term investing. And this narrowed focus of attention is is one of them. Investing for our retirement is a long-term goal. And of course, you know, all financial analysts tell us that if we think about retirement uh, and investing for retirement as a long-term goal, we're going to be better off. The way that compound interest works, of course, is that if we start early, even with smaller amounts of money, we're going to be better off in the long run than if we try to play catch up later in life. So do people do that? No, not right. at the rate that uh, our countries, our, our world should. And so I started asking, you know, a bunch of students that I was working with, university students, like, do you save for retirement? You know, they were all in their 20s. They all had jobs to, you know, help support their tuition and, and college costs. And they were on the verge of graduating, right? So thinking about their job, setting up the right internships, getting getting a foothold in the industry that they wanted to be in was forefront on their mind. And I asked 60 of them, 60 students I was working with, do you save for retirement? All of them said no. Nope. None of them were putting away <laughs> any any of their money uh, for retirement. And neither was I when I was at that age. So it's not me pointing fingers, right? It's just acknowledging that that's the truth. That's the truth of it for many people uh, in their first jobs. And I asked why, right? Of course, the answers are many. But one of the most common things that they said was like, retirement just seems so far away. That just seems so far off. It's like not even relevant, right? Or I just can't put myself in that mindset. And that made me think about all of that work that we had done with exercise, right? Why do people have a hard time getting an extra half a mile in? Because that seems so far away. When you're at the beginning of a race, tacking on an extra half a mile, you're at the beginning of, a, of an exercise, bout of exercise, like adding on an extra half mile, like, oh no, I can't, that just seems so far away. So I was really seeing some commonalities with the work we had done with exercise and what you know my students were telling me about the reason why they're not saving for retirement. And so I thought, well, can we try this strategy that worked for exercise with these students? Can we can we use a strategy, a visual strategy that will help narrow that gap separating where they are now and what retired me will look like, you know, 50 years in the future, 40 years in the future? If that seems so far away, can can we create a narrowed focus of attention to bring that future self closer to the current self? And will that change their thinking about saving for retirement? So what I did was take their, take a picture of them and I morphed them, took special computer program uh, software and morphed their face with an older successful person like mm. Maya Angelou, Dan Rather, and some <laughs> other, you know, uh, Betty White, <laughs> some famous celebrities out there and gave them a copy of what they might look like in their retired self. So they saw themselves with a few more wrinkles, gray hair, uh, and more, you know, more sunspots on on their face. Almost all of them were horrified. One one guy, one guy <laughs> oh said, "I think they look pretty good." The <laughs> <laughs> vast majority were like, "Oh God!" Like literally, <laughs> "Oh God!" Or it took their breath away. So, um, but it, it gave them that visual. It was a visual strategy to help them, like literally, see themselves in the future. And then they spend a couple minutes just thinking about what would my life be like when I'm this person? What's my day going to look like? What, how will I be spending my time? So they just did that for a few minutes. They, they mentally and literally saw themselves in the, in the future. And then I did another survey asking them right now with your current, with your current salary, will you start saving for your retirement? And 55 out of 60 of them said yes. Hmm. So Right, it helped to bridge that gap. It made that far off future seem seem more current, more present day and more relevant 
the decisions I'm making now, I could see the outcome for something that I that I will be in the future. It bridged that gap. It brought that financial finish line closer to the present, and it increased their interest in saving um, saving for retirement. Now that's just an anecdote, right? That wasn't a scientific study I did, sure. but it was based on it was based on somebody um, Hal Hirschfeld's re- research at UCLA, and he uses that tactic as well to help bridge that gap between the here and the far off future, and it does produce real changes in people's interest um, and their their accounting that they do with each paycheck that comes home. So you know that's one strategy that I think we can apply narrowed focus to a long-term goal, especially when the problem with maintaining our commitment to that long-term goal is that that payoff is not going to be an immediate reward, right? So it might be hard to make changes today, to make sacrifices today for something that we're not going to see the gains from, you know, until far away. We need to make that far away seem a little bit closer to the here and now. Yeah. Yeah. We certainly all have a hard time delaying that gratification. So yeah. Yeah. In terms of of using a vision board, what 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 are your thoughts on that? Well, it's super common, right? And maybe some people aren't familiar with it, but I bet a lot of people are. Um, it's the idea that when you're trying to think about what you want out of life, you can create a visual montage of of what that you know perfect future will will entail. So maybe there's you know cutouts of. Um, of, of what you'll look like, the clothes that you'll be wearing, the office you'll be occupying, the car that you have, the family family that you'll be spending your time with. Uh, and you like you know literally scrapbook it, right? Mm-hmm. And then put that montage somewhere where you'll see it. And And then some people go on to say that having put that positive energy out into the world, uh, increases the odds that you're gonna see a return on that investment and in positive spirit. Um, not everybody believes in that the spirituality aspect of it, and they still use vision boards. In fact, there was a recent survey done um, by TD Bank of 500 small business entrepreneurs, and um, and the vast majority of them say that they use vision boards um, in in crafting their business plan, deciding whether to start a business in the first place, or communicating with. Um, members of their team about where they're trying to head in the future. And this is a strategy that's really common, particularly among millennials, although it's present, you know, in all age groups. So a lot of people are using it. And it's super, it's, it's really great when we're trying to think about what we want, where are we trying to head? And for a lot of people, that's a challenge, right? Like, what do I want out of my life? We rarely give ourselves the time to really think about that to you know conscientiously, you know, think about all facets of my life. Where do I want to be? What does that perfect like look like? And we might not really have an answer. So that process of making a vision board is actually a really good one when we're trying to articulate what we want. And it might be a good one too if we're trying to communicate to others uh, what as an organization we're working towards. But the problem is that some people just stop with that. Mm. You know, having put it out there, this is what I want. And, and like maybe literally putting it up there on our wall, we might think is a good reminder and that that would be a motivational tactic. But actually research says that if we stop with that stage of goal setting, that we actually decrease the odds of making good on our commitments to ourselves. We're less likely to meet those goals if we stop with that, with that stage of setting the goal, visualizing, daydreaming, fantasizing about what my perfect life will look like. Now, what the researchers did was look at people's physiology. They measured systolic blood pressure. Now, systolic blood pressure, it's the top number on on your blood pressure reading, but psychologically, it's an index of our readiness to get up and go, to literally do something. If we're just about to, you know, take, to start a run, blood pressure goes up. It goes up in, in animals of all species, including humans, blood pressure increases and systolic blood pressure in particular. It also goes up when we just want to start thinking. Like, if I have to focus up, here's a task that's really important, blood pressure goes up then too. It's a physiological marker of our mobilization, our body's readiness to engage, engage in something that we care about. Now, what these colleagues of mine at New York University found was that when people daydream about what that ideal future will look like, their blood pressure decreases. Hmm. It's not that it just stays the same. It definitely doesn't go up right? It's, it goes down. It's like we're chilling out. 
Right. And in a sense, what we have done is like, you know, we've placed ourselves in that ideal future experience. We've sort of vicariously consumed that that future perfect life. And and we are enjoying that. You know, we enjoy that experience of fantasizing. And it actually means that our body, what it does to our body is sort of, you know, help us feel like it's goal, it's mission accomplished, goal satisfied because I can see what I want for myself now. And I've, I've seen myself in that place, but that's not enough, right? Just seeing ourselves in that place isn't the goal. The goal is to be in that place. So what do we do then? The, the suggestion I would have is like, yes, if you enjoy vision boarding or creating mission statements or you know, uh, making a, a to-do list for the next 10 years, if that's of interest, you keep doing that. That is an important step of goal setting, but we need to do a couple other things. The next one is that you have to make a concrete plan of action, right? If we have this ideal future, you know, we can get lost in the mix of like, well, what should I, what's the first step supposed to look like? So when we're setting our goals, we need to simultaneously or in those, in that same opportunity, think about, okay, what can I do today? What can I do this week? What can my goal be for this month? to help me uh, make progress and take this far off goal and break it down into something tangible so that I know which direction am I going to even get started. And the third thing is that we need to take an opportunity to foreshadow failure. We need to think about the obstacles that we're going to experience along the way uh, and that will increase the odds that we can maintain our motivation. In some sense, it might sound odd, right? Like I'm saying at the stage of goal setting, Think about all the ways that you'll fail. Think about all the things that are gonna be hard. And that might seem like, well, how is that gonna work, right? Shouldn't that be demotivating? If I've now just like talked myself into doing this thing, how is it gonna be helpful to think about how hard it's gonna be? And like, here are the six things that are gonna get in my way. Well, that works because it gives us a lifeline and it gives us a safety net should we encounter these obstacles. Right, we've taken the opportunity, we've taken the time in advance to troubleshoot so that when we're in a moment of crisis or challenge, when our resources are thin, we don't have the opportunity or the time or the means to try to figure out how am I gonna work through this? We wanna just be able to quickly, like a snap of a finger, turn to plan B or plan C. There's a really cool story that I, that I love about Michael Phelps and how he uses this strategy of foreshadowing failure. In 2008, he was at the Beijing Olympics and he was on the brink of doing something that no Olympic athlete had ever done in the history of the Olympic Games, which is eight, win eight gold medals in a single, single Olympic game. He had already won seven. He just had the 200 meter fly in front of them, of him in order to, to break this you know, historic record. And as he dove in, his goggles started to leak. By the third, the third lap, by his you know, third length of the pool, he had just one to go. He just had to get from one length back to the beginning and, and it would be over. But by then his goggles were completely filled with water and he was swimming blind. Now I would have totally panicked. I'm also not <laughs> an athlete, as I mentioned, or a swimmer of any kind, but he didn't, right? It wasn't a moment of panic for him because he had already planned for this. He practiced swimming with his goggles completely filled with water. His coach would, would actually, right before he dove in, step on his goggles and shatter them so that he would have to swim with his eyes closed um, or without them as, as, as an aid. So it wasn't a big deal. He already had the plan B for this. He just started counting his strokes because he knew exactly how many strokes it would take for him to get from one end of the pool to the other. So without, without dropping a beat, without panicking, he just started counting his strokes and he won that 200 meter fly. He won his eighth gold medal and he would go on to win 15 more. So that I think is a great example of the power of foreshadowing failure. He didn't, he didn't have the opportunity in, the, in this last lap to, to think about what should he do now that he's lost the power of sight. He already knew what his plan would be and he did it and it worked out. Amazing, I love it. So. Looking back, and, and obviously the book is, is a huge part of your life right now. I'm sure that you're having millions of conversations about it and thinking about it all the time. What are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of is that I tried all these strategies on myself, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a behavioral scientist, right? So I know what the data ha have to say, but I'm just a person at the end of the day. And so all of these things that I'm saying are problems that people experience. I experience them too. To write this book, I decided... It, the opportunity came when my son was one month old. It was my first child. He was brand new. And the editor said, 
write this book. I was like, oh, great, thanks. <laughs> you know, wonderful. Good I'm timing. So glad. Yeah, completely <laughs> overwhelmed. And she said, oh, and by the way, you know, um, you try try all these on yourself too. And I thought, you know, I should because I'm not here. You know, I'm not an oracle. I'm not. I haven't achieved perfection as a behavioral scientist. These are problems that I experience too. And I decided to set the goal. It was a, it was a really dumb choice. <laughs> in hindsight, but I'm really glad that I did it. Uh, I decided I wanted to become a drummer. I wanted to be a rock drummer and play, be able to like seriously play one rock song on yes. a drum kit. Um, and I was gonna learn that uh, while my son was in his first year of life and write about it in the book and try all the tactics on myself. We live in a one, we lived in a one bedroom apartment in Manhattan. <laughs> uh, so this was a really bad goal to set, right? But I did, I set that goal. I tried these strategies out of myself and some work and some didn't. And I realized that, you know, applying some of these tactics at the wrong point in, in my progression could have been the problem. Um, so what I am proud of is that this book is not, you know, like a formula. If you do exactly this, you too will, uh, you know, achieve, achieve a golden state, right? It acknowledges the real challenges that people and, and I face when we're trying to, um, you know, tackle some of our biggest challenges. And, uh, but it offers, you know, tools. A carpenter can't build a house with just a hammer, right? You need options. So the point of this is to offer these options to help people expand their, their toolbox to overcome the multitude of challenges. So I did learn that one song. Um, yes. It, yeah, I performed it. I put on a show. Amazing. I, I a show. And, and so now if, um, you know, if anybody ever needs a one hit wonder, uh, they can call on me. <laughs> what uh, song is it? Uh, Your Love. It's from, yeah, uh, it's an it's like an 80s tune. It hit the um, UK top 100. It was number six. It never really made okay. it very big. It, and as I was learning this song, it was re-released, um, you know, in the last couple of years as a, as a jingle for dryer sheets. Oh. It is not a cool song. It is not a cool song, but it's my song. Well, yeah. it, it, it's now my song and I'll own that. Well, congratulations on achieving that goal. I'm going to circle back and say that was a terrible, terrible idea as a father of a four-year-old and a one-year-old in one bedroom apartment playing the drums. Where there's a will. <laughs> it was dumb, but Love I've it. got it up now. <laughs> well, Emily, thank you so much for coming on. Where can Savage Nation learn more about you and where can they get a copy of Clearer, Closer, Better? You can get a copy of the book wherever books are sold. And you can check me out for more uh, more articles, more tips um, on my LinkedIn page. I link to all of my articles there. Excellent. Well, Savage Nation, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, show Emily your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Pick up a copy of Clearer, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World, wherever fine books are sold. And find Emily on LinkedIn. I'll link to everything in the notes of the show. Thanks again, Emily. Thank you so much. And until next time. Keep fighting the good fight as we are all in this together.